Hello world, Constantino here, and today's video marks the halfway point of our Solid Principles Tour. The Liskov Substitution Principle is named after Barbara Liskov, an institute professor at MIT and Turing Award winner, which is the highest distinction of computer science. It was first introduced by her in 1987. Along with Jeanette Wink, they described the principle more thoroughly in 1994. Fun fact. It's the only principle that has the name of the person inventing it. In the previous video, we saw how the open-close principle is about adding abstractions and implementing them with different realizations. Liskov substitution principle is about the rules that a subtype must follow in order to properly replace its parent so that it can stand in its place without the client class getting broken. In a sense, it is the next but actually very important step of open-close principle, the video of which will be linked in the description. I have seen many fellow engineers giving up on this principle completely, just because it seems overwhelming at first. I'm about to show you the official definition, but before I do so, a friendly heads up. If you're unfamiliar with the Liskov substitution principle, then please don't freak out. Ready? Okay, here it comes. <laughs> So, did you fall over your chair or are you still with me? I promise I can explain. Okay, so first let's bring this definition back on the screen again. Read it once, read it twice. Maybe try to make some sense of it. Or don't. You can pretty much ignore it for now. Yes, that's right. Those are notations useful in academic papers. But we are developers, not mathematicians. And while I do appreciate the power of mathematics on compressing information, I also understand that this is not the optimal way to communicate with the developer's mind. So what we're going to do is this. Use a more practical way to get the idea, using an example, going over the rules, and then we'll come back later, look at the definition again, and see if we can read between the lines. I promise you, it is not that hard. If you remember from a couple of slides back, the goal of the LSP is to continue from where the open-close principle left us to give us rules of realizing abstractions. It is not enough to simply create those abstractions, but we need to know how to implement them, how to extend them. Barbara Liskov basically understood that extending a class does not automatically mean that the subclass is compatible with their application. And as Uncle Bob has said, subtypes must be substitutable for their base types. Also, at this time, take a moment to appreciate how all the principles basically complement each other. They were all discovered at different times by different people, yet they are all based on the same ideas and they agree on the same foundations. This, in my opinion, is a great indicator that they have a very inherent truth inside them. And that's why they stand the test of time. So it's not weird or unusual that whenever we discuss a new principle, you may find familiar with one of the ones that we've already gone over in the past. And yes, I did not forget, example time. Let's use the most classic example on the LSP. It is classic because it works. Imagine in the real world, you have a rectangle. Now, a square is what we say a special case of a rectangle, right? In object-oriented programming, we specify usually this type of relationship using inheritance, subclassing a type, essentially. Liskov substitution principle tells us about behavioral subclassing, which means that we take the behavior of a subclass into consideration, not just the mechanics of inheritance, for example, just because you can't technically inherit and override methods of a class does not mean that this subclass would work when replacing its parent. We will see now how inheriting from rectangle when declaring a square would make no sense in software. This would be a simple and scientific diagram of the relationship of those two types. In UML diagrams, we use arrows to indicate dependencies, and in this case, the square depends on the rectangle since it inherits from it. It knows the existence of the rectangle, while the rectangle has no way of knowing that the square even exists. So this inheritance hierarchy violates the LSP. While we are subclassing the rectangle class, we end up with change x and change y functions on the square, which makes no sense, as there is no way of changing them independently. The property of a square is that they change together, x and y, Thus, the square is not a proper subtype of rectangle in software. 
you can argue that, hey, no problem, I'll just assign the x to the y and uh, problem solved, right? Well, not really. First of all, doing so should be a red flag, as the name of the method is change x, not change x and y. So this is already getting misleading. But even if you don't care about that, you can never know that the color of the rectangle can accept changes on both dimensions at the same time. Maybe it's an editing software, like Paint, and dragging on the edge of the rectangle should never change the other dimension. That hopefully gave us an idea. But how do we know if a subclass follows the list of substitution principle? I mean, we can understand when a class violates it. It only takes one scenario that a subclass cannot replace a parent without breaking the existing code. But are we innocent until proof of guilt? Luckily, no. We can indeed follow some steps to properly subclass a class, like a framework. Thus, understanding that our class follows the LSP. In their book, Program Development in Java, Abstraction, Specification, and Object-Oriented Design, Barbara Liskov and John Gadag group these rules into three categories, the signature rule, the properties rule, and the methods rule. Statically typed languages such as Java, C Sharp, or Kotlin already help us in some of these rules by imposing compile time errors when broken. Dynamically, or duck type languages as we say, are not so lucky in that regard. Remember, when trying to conform to the LSP, we have to perform a check for every one of the following rules. So, starting with the signature rules, those rules have to do with the signature of a class's functions. Method argument types. This rule states that the overridden subtype method argument types can be identical or wider, which means more general, than the supertype method argument types. Kotlin is safe at compiled time, but generally the idea is simple. Don't give more specific arguments in the overridden methods. In Kotlin, you cannot even do that. You have to give the same type exactly as an argument or you'll get a compiled time error. Next, return types. The return type of the overridden subtype method can be narrower than the return type of the supertype method. Kotlin is again safe at compile time, but you can actually have a more specific type than its super method as the return type of the overridden method. For example, if we have a getNumber method that returns a number, you can override it and return a more specific float type. The idea is that if the caller can handle number which contains float, it can also handle float. You cannot return a more generic, for example, any type, since the caller almost, almost surely does not handle it. And finally, exceptions. The subtype method can throw fewer or narrower exceptions than the supertype method. Java was safe at compile time for checked exceptions, but Kotlin did not have checked exceptions. Thus, Kotlin is not safe for runtime exceptions. You have to take care of, of this yourself. Again, think about it. If you override a method, you cannot have it throwing exceptions that the super function does not. The caller would not have the proper try cuts for it. You can, of course, throw less exceptions. Now let's see property rules. Those rules have to do with the class's variables and properties and how their values evolve or behave. With these rules, we can start to realize the behavioral subtyping idea that you can subtype all you want, but it's not going to work if we break the intended behavior of the superclass. Starting with the class invariant rule. Now, a class invariant is an assertion concerning object properties that must be true for all valid states of the object. All subtype methods, inherited and new, must maintain or strengthen the supertimes class invariants. Let's go back for a moment at our player class. We have health as a property, but it is ranging from 0 to 100. This rule is not validated somewhere, but we know as clients of this class that we expect that value to be inside this range. If we were to subclass it with a, say, premium player, but a premium player can go above 100 health, that could break clients of this class that do not expect this to be the case. Moving on to the history constraint. The subclass methods, inherited or new, should not allow state changes that the base class did not allow. If, for example, a value should be set only during the initialization process of the object, the subclasses shouldn't be allowed to change it later. For example, if our player becomes dead, 
then he should not become alive again. But we see that a premium player can revive himself. This breaks the history rule. And finally, we have two more rules, the method rules. The first, preconditions rule. A subtype can weaken, but not strengthen, the precondition for a method it overrides. Let's see an example. Our player class can go to the next level, but expects the points to be between 0 and 100. That's the precondition. If the premium player weakens it by saying, it's okay, I just need it to be between 0 and 150, there's no problem, because if a client was used to providing values between 0 and 100 without breaking, then it can still use these values and nothing would break. However, if the verified player needs it to be tighter, let's say 0 to 70, then the client who knew that 90 is still a valid value would now cause the app to throw an exception. Finally, the post-condition rule. The subtype can strengthen but not weaken the post-condition for a method it overrides. Or, in other words, do not confuse the client of the method with some unwanted effect. If the player should die in the kill function and your overridden kill does not actually change his state to dead after being called, that's a post-condition rule violation. Let's recap the rules. Method argument types, return types, exceptions, class invariance, history constraint, preconditions, and finally, post-conditions. Now let's go over a rectangle and square example and see where it breaks. I mean, we saw that it violates the LSP, but we did not exactly know why, which rule was broken. We didn't know about rules back then, but now we do. And we said that if we follow those rules, we'll always know the truth about the least substitution principle. So here it goes. Method argument types, no problem. Return types, they seem fine. Exceptions? Okay, no exceptions thrown. Class invariance? Well, this needs discussing. Rectangle does not have any upper end invariance, but square has that x must be equal to y at all times. Let's say that I can solve that with a hack of changing y inside the changeX function. Well, this leads us to the violation of the next rule, history constraint. Because in rectangle, this says that when I change x, y stays the same. But here, I violate that, obviously. So this is the problem. This is the violation. Preconditions and postconditions are okay. None of these rules break. Well, that's it. I think that the Liskov substitution principle, and probably you agree on that, is one of the toughest principles to grasp. And currently, you may be overwhelmed about all those rules. However, you reach this far. This is further than most developers reach when researching for this principle. So be sure to go over the video more than one times to get a feel of the rules and leave a comment if you have any questions. You can also reach me at my links in my profile. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.